Um, this afternoon's session is a panel session and uh, we have four panel members and I welcome them all warmly. We've got Dr Rick Brown from the Australian Institute of Criminology, Chief Robert Davis from Lethbridge Regional Police Service in Alberta, Canada, Dr Garner Clancy from the University of Sydney and Inspector Regan Carr from the Queensland Police Service. And whilst I've sort of done a very, very brief intro of who they are, I'm going to throw to them immediately just to, uh, to, to identify themselves uh, personally, but also and ask them what their current role is within their particular organisation so that you all have the background, um, so you might be able to focus a particular question to a particular person. So if I could, uh, if I could throw uh, initially to, uh, to Chief Robert Davis. Thanks. Sure, uh, thanks, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, very impressive to see this many people here at the last session. I've been in other panels where it's myself, a couple of tumbleweeds, and three crickets. So <laughs> this is great. Uh, uh, thank you for asking that we, uh, that we introduce ourselves. I had some questions over the last two days about uh, the, when I say chief, do I mean tribal chief? And it's not. No, I, in no way am I a tribal chief. I'm a chief of police, which in our rank system is equivalent of a commissioner. So I oversee the, the police service. Uh, day-to-day -day operations administration, quasi-political, and uh, I just wanted to just make sure I clarified that, so. Yeah, yeah thanks it? very much, Chief. Regan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Regan Carr, and um, I'm the actual manager of the Queensland Police Service Domestic and Family Violence uh, Vulnerable Persons Unit. Fantastic, thanks. Garner. My name's Garner Clancy. I work at the University of Sydney in the Institute of Criminology that turned 50 this year. Uh, my focus of research is very much for, um, about crime prevention and various elements of crime prevention. And Rick. I'm uh, Rick Brown. I'm Deputy Director at the Australian Institute of Criminology. Basically, I look after the research that the uh, Institute undertakes and uh, get to terrorise the researchers, some of whom have been presenting here over the last two days. Well, thanks very much, and uh, welcome to our panel members. That's great. Um, now, thank you. Thank you. Now, before we begin the series of incisive probing questions that we've got prepared for you, panel members, I'd just like to ask a couple of uh, broader questions. And the first one is, given the theme of this conference, what have you heard over these last couple of days that is innovative in crime prevention? Now, that's an open question to any panel member to start with. I'll go first. Um, what, for me, the, uh, the, the stuff I found innovative and, and fantastic was Kate's work, Kate Bauer's uh, presentation, mm. um, which uh, just, um, and I know Kate has been coming, uh, been developed over a, a number of years to get to this point, but the mix uh, of the work around um, the near repeats for burglaries and then overlaying it with uh, the you know, GPS uh, data for patrolling, I think it's fantastic. Um, you may have trouble on leaving the country because we've actually phone immigration and had you, your passport cancelled yeah. just so that you end up staying with us at the uh, AIC. So. Sensational. <laughs> <laughs> I'd endorse Rick's comments. I think uh, Kate's presentation and discussion around big data and the use of big data for the purposes of uh, crime analysis I think is a real step forward. I also think the discussions around the science that's evolved in relation to evaluations, the, the robustness of evaluations that we now see, we wouldn't have been talking about 15, 20 years ago. And I think that's a great leap forward. But can I also add a cautionary note that I think the word innovation can be overused. There's a lot of grunt work required for good crime prevention work. And at times, I think there's a risk that we lose sight of what are important things that are mundane in our search for innovation. I think we let go of some things that are really useful in searching for new and bright, shiny ideas. So just a cautionary tale. I suppose it's a truism to say that most success in life is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Uh, yeah. Regan. Um, I suppose probably just collectively of everything, the thing that's really shone out to me is that gone are the days that we can rely on anecdotal comments and every, to be able to sort of get our funding, to be able to keep moving forward. We really have to be far more sophisticated as well, and I think everyone is really starting to the clear point that it's got to be evidence-based. But it doesn't have to be that complicated either to be evidence-based and what we're trying to achieve. And that's one of the things I think we're pushing through, and it's really a clear message. And I think as a police service in particular, we have typically relied very much on 
because we do it and because we have to do it. And we can't continually rely on that for demand and resource. We have to actually have it, the scientific evidence behind it. And I think that's a really clear message for me as well, and it's been supported. And I reflect on Peter Martin's presentation yesterday about the history of the medical profession yeah. as, a, as an analogy to where they came from and where they are now based on science and evidence. And, and that's a really, uh, really strong theme that came through. Mm. Chief. I agree with uh, what Kate presented on the use of the data. Just phenomenal because you can see the light at the end of the tunnel where you can actually turn it into a tangible result. Uh, but one that also really stuck out for me was the presentation by the two fellows from New Zealand. Uh, a lot of my career has been in organized crime and how it impacts Aboriginal populations. And to see them take an organized crime, they're there, to take an organized crime unit and take the mindset and the shift to move into the preventative, outstanding job, gentlemen. Outstanding job. Okay, so we can tick off the point, the SOP to New Zealand. That's that's it for the New Zealanders. Okay, <laughs> All right, thank, thanks very much for that. No, no that, that was a. I was actually in for that presentation. I agree with you. That was uh, that was a nice piece of work right there. I'm just going to jump over the question, general question number two, and go to just general question number three, and pose the question to you: How would you describe the current position of crime prevention in Australia, right now? Probably going to be hard for the chief to answer this one, but, uh, you know. <laughs> Again, I'll start. Um, yeah, this is a tricky one because crime prevention kind of ebbs and flows, I guess. Uh, so there'll be periods where, um, certainly from a federal and, and a state level, you'll have um, you know, significant grant programs that, that, that are occurring. Um, and I think we've been to some extent in a, in a phase where there's not been a lot of that around and I think we're seeing some emerge in Victoria now but um, we, we kind of see it from, uh, from when we look at the, the, the bids that we get on the um, Australian Crime and Violence Prevention Awards that we for a period we haven't, haven't received so many coming through and we think that's probably because there weren't so many projects being, uh, being funded um, and that may not be a bad thing uh, because um, you know everybody complains there was presentations uh, over the course of these two days about how uh, short-term funding can be a real issue anyway. Yeah. So, so if, it, if that is uh, a result of, of there being more mainstreaming of, of crime prevention, well, maybe that's not such a bad thing if it's happening, I guess. And I, and I think certainly we've seen you know, great work over the two days which suggests that uh, it, there is a, there's a whole lot of work going on by, uh, by organisations in this space. Um, it feels like it's kind of... I'm not, I'm not sure if it's just a function of these two days, but a lot of police-related projects. I don't know if there's other sectors that are, that, that are dropping off in that field, of that area, though. Mm -hmm. And after we've heard it from a couple of other the Australian panel members, we'll be interested to hear Rob's perspective on where he's from, and particularly in Alberta, how the crime prevention current situation is as well. So if I just throw to Garnon out to that, for that question. <coughs> find myself in agreement with Rick again. Um, I think the mainstreaming of crime prevention is a, is a real success. The fact that we might not talk about it in quite the same way because organisations are just now routinely doing it, I think is a wonderful thing. But can I draw attention to something that uh, I've certainly felt over the, the course of the two days. One is there's been a lot of discussion about crime science and that's, I think, a fantastic um, bit of progress in the last probably 15 years. Uh, we've had some discussion of kind of the the prevention science, and, and that's um, useful. But I want, want to draw attention to a sort of third science that I think has been neglected a little bit in recent times, and it's political science. I think there's a, a, a great risk that we get too focused on instrumental outcomes and forget the political context within which we work. There are some really big questions uh, beckoning for our attention at the moment. And if I take some of the forefathers of crime prevention in this country, they suggested that we should really maintain a, an eye on the political questions. For example, um, Adam Sutton said maybe crime prevention evolved as an antidote to law and order politics. Well, it's been pretty dismal if, uh, in terms of success on that front because we keep hitting new incarceration records in New South Wales. We keep hitting new records of overrepresentation of Indigenous people in our criminal justice system. So there are really big political questions I think should still be part of our discussion and, and that's why I was kind of uh, pleased to hear Rosie Batty this morning giving us a real strong sense of the importance of some of these discussions and narratives in the community. But I think we should hang on to this uh, third science and not just get too focused on uh, crime data and, and, and crime analysis. Thanks, Garner. Yeah, Regan. 
I, uh, I think for me, I'll have to probably go into the area for me that's my sort of passion, which is the domestic and family violence, and you're looking at our vulnerable people. And probably talking about Rosie, but since about 2014, we've seen in, in Australia, this conversation has continued in regard to looking at domestic and family violence and looking at how we actually do respond to our vulnerable people in our communities. And I think one of the things that I've seen is the conversation hasn't been stalled. There is, we probably do use the word innovation, but there are people, it's not just relying now on the government organisations. They truly are coming amongst the communities. Our business organisations are coming into it, which we probably see through even our White Ribbon um, um, partners there. And I think from, we use the term crime prevention a lot and sometimes it's just tossed out there, but I do think probably for me with domestic and family violence, I am starting to see some really significant inroads and I am starting to see it's not just collaboration, which we use, but it truly is information sharing. It truly is actually working together in partnership with where it's all about. Because these are social issues we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And the only way you're going to do social issues and then police these sort of social issues is with your partner agencies. Isn't that preventative? Because otherwise we're just going to be crisis situation all the time. And it's all about that. That's probably what I've seen. And I think the beauty of having Rosie here, her conversations will never tire and they'll never get old. Mm -hmm. And we will continually listen to everything she's saying. Me? Thanks very much, Regan. Well, now the Canadian perspective in terms of the current state of uh, crime prevention, I'd like to hear from you, Robert. Uh, it's well, we'd it, like to hear from you. Yeah, it, it's really improving in the last year, uh, if, uh, again, because of a change in government. Your comment on the political context is so true because we've, we've come out of 10 years, a decade, of a Conservative government that was very law and order, that implemented minimum sentences, which didn't help reduce incarceration rates one bit, and then the public feeding into that, that the measure of success for police doing their job was the number of lockups, arrests, successful convictions. So now that we've seen a change in government federally and at a number of provincial levels where the governments have shifted to more liberal governments, uh, there's now the political will and the conversation has shifted as a nation to the harm reduction. There are pockets that are further ahead in the harm reduction sense, uh, such as Vancouver, Ontario, Saskatchewan with their hub model where you attack root causes of issues. Uh, specifically in Alberta, we had a change in our provincial government after 40 years of conservative rule to now a more liberal, the NDP party, which is more liberal in their positions. So we're, quick, we're seeing a lot of change very rapidly in the province of Alberta to a harm reduction model and long overdue uh, because as we all know, the, the crime and punishment model just doesn't work. Thanks very much. Now the third general question that I've got here is what more can be done to get crime prevention theory and research into practice. So uh, I guess to some extent the old so story of operationalising strategy. But uh, mm -hmm. so, so how do we get better at that and you know how can the audience here sort of contribute to that I guess. So mm -hmm. could I throw to Ghana in the first instance on this one please? You can and I'll just write down what I'm going to say. Um, the, 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 I think the investment in evaluation is obviously really important, the dissemination of findings. But I also think um, with the discussion that is maturing around the complexity of evaluation, we potentially freeze out some people who would ordinarily be reflective and participating in, in evaluation. So I'd sort of like to see the, the progress around complexity continue, but equally for people to feel confident to step into that space, because more people should be engaged in reflective practice, thinking about what did I do? Did it work? How will I demonstrate that it worked? What are the learnings? How do I share those learnings? And I think we've heard a lot at this conference about the number of clearing houses. There are many clearing houses that now exist, What Works, Campbell Collaboration and the like, uh, the Pop Centre. I think we need to make much greater use of those. I'm still surprised as I go around different places that they're not as well known as one would anticipate. Um, so trying to ensure that po uh, policy makers, practitioners, politicians go to those sources to get some detailed information about what does work rather than just constantly coming up with kind of new hackneyed, uh, hackneyed uh, ideas. Thanks very much, Ghana. Well, I mean, it's an obvious question for, for, for Rick as well from the Australian Institute of Criminology. So um, given this is a partnered uh, uh, conference, mm. uh, you know, I think there's a, there's a thread there for you. So. It, it, it's not one I've necessarily got an easy answer to, though, I think. Um, 
and it's a sense of uh, yeah, that kind of if, if you build it, they will come in, in a sense of uh, uh, the kind of link between research and practice, I guess. Kind of, the, you know, certainly you know, as, as a researcher, you kind of like to think that everybody's going to read your work. Mm. Uh, the reality is that very few academics do, let alone practitioners. Um, maybe that's my work. Um, but <laughs> but the, the, I, and I think we need to find better ways of, of getting uh, the research in, into practice. So whether that's in terms of uh, more events, um, whether it's in terms of um, at producing shorter you know, briefs of, of, of uh, the research, recognizing that people don't read long uh, materials, or whether it's about uh, professionalizing crime prevention. You know, we, we, it's, uh, um, you know, a, as a group, we're a bit of a ragtag bunch of, uh, that come from all kinds of different disciplines. And I guess that's one of the beauties of it. Um, but at the same time, that often means that we don't necessarily come with the, the kind of theory and rigorous kind of background learning in, the, in, uh, in crime prevention that perhaps would be useful. And I guess from a um, from a policing practitioner's perspective too, you know, our culture doesn't see crime prevention as necessarily as sexy as some of the other stuff in the in the enforcement side of things either. So there's a bit of room to shift in our organisation attitudinally, in my view, at least anyway. So, um, Robert, your your perspectives on that, uh, you know, con converting um, research uh, into practice. Uh, you took the words out of my mouth. I actually have it written down here. Culture. Uh, the, the policing community at large, we have to have a cultural shift uh, uh, and recognize the importance of strong research and then turning that into uh, strategies can be used by the practi practitioners. And I really believe it starts with right at the front end of our policing career where our recruits understand the value. And if we can embed it throughout one's career, it'll take time, but it'll become such a part of the organization that it's mainstream. It may not be sexy, but it'll be mainstream, understood, and we can see the results. But the other piece of it, is uh, when we see the tangible results, when we see the success stories. I think the police community, we're, uh, I'm not sure what your fire services are like in Australia. In North America, the fire services are great at promoting themselves, whether it be their calendars or calendars, actual yeah, efforts. Yeah. We, we get the same problems here, yeah. <laughs> but, but they do a great job of promoting uh, what they do well. And, and they have partnered with academics in North America for years and they share those stories widely across the continent. Uh, whereas in the police community, we don't. So I think when we have the strategies that are based on in evidence, the transition into actual crime prevention that we can show works, we need to really celebrate those. So then the cynics uh, have no choice but to believe it. The proof's in the pudding, if you will. Okay. Uh, great perspective. Thank you for that. Regan. Yeah, I, think, I think it's as simple as just operationalizing a lot of it because we have it all there. You have all the research and people have it. But it's getting it down to the ground and getting it to the, the first response officers, getting it to the middle management to actually embrace it a lot of the time. Because I don't think a lot of police in particular, they don't understand, and we've never really spoken about the advantage and the benefits of it. We consider it at a very you know, top strategic corporate level, but the reality of it is we're not the ones that actually are doing the work to be able to try and show the evidence base for it. And I th there's, a very, there's still a, such a strong disconnect, I think, and there's a lot of cynicism with it particularly with the policing organisations, not really appreciate and understanding the value of research. That's the evidence base behind everything that we're doing. Okay. Thank you. I mean, in the Society of Evidence-Based Policing that's been established here in uh, Australia and New Zealand, as Peter Martin reported yesterday, the second such society behind the UK um, to be established in the, in the, in the, in the global network, um, you know, to, to me, speaks volumes to that particular point and to the science, the emerging science and the emerging need for evidence rather than just that anecdotal evidence and, the, and you know, we, we think that works or we, we know that works. But it's actually accepting failures then to, to yeah. accept the successes and I think that's offers. We don't tend to like to see any failures to be particularly documented. Sure, sure. <laughs> now, we've got a couple of particular questions here that I'll throw to the, the panel now or particular members of the panel. Um, and the first one is a, um, is a particular question to, to Chief Robert Davies. And um, it is, Canada has led the way in recognising the role of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in crime. Are you able to offer some comments on this from your perspective and experience? And I know the answer, that the, answer the short answer is yes, he can. So over to you, Robert. Oh, thanks. Uh, great question. I uh, thank you to the person that asked that. Yes, uh, 
FASD, in our Aboriginal community, we do know there are higher rates than the general population of FASD. And it is such an issue that a number of police services in Canada, I can speak for Lethbridge, uh, where I am today, it is such an issue that we have an officer full-time dedicated to dealing with our FASD uh, offenders uh, to help them navigate the justice system and ideally uh, be diverted from the justice system and then uh, liaising with them so that they're making right choices, not being exploited. And why I mention exploited is when I was working in Ontario, Northern Ontario, what we saw were organized crime groups and street gangs exploiting FASD uh, youth to do the, the dirty work. Give them a very simple instruction. Take this package over there and I'll give you $100, you'll be rich. And so the person would carry it out not realizing that they're being a drug mule. And it's that type of exploitation that, that sickens me and sickens law enforcement so that uh, we, we recognized it and we've stepped up as a policing community to really proactively be on top of working with support uh, services to help the, those afflicted with FASD, to help them in choices to be there as role models and mentors. And we've put a lot of time and effort into it and money well spent. And I urge you, any of you that are, uh, I'm going, looking at all the data, I, I'm going to assume that FASD is higher in your Aboriginal population, very much like it is in Canada. Be proactive in this. If you're not addressing it today, get on it, because it's, it, it, we cannot allow people to be exploited uh, by organized crime, like I saw, and we have to have the, the systems in place to support those afflicted with FASD. Thanks very much, Robert. Any other panel members like to make any comment on this particular topic from with the, in the Australian context or the Queensland context? Um, I'd, I'd leave it open to the panel. Mm -hmm. Um, if not, well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll move on to the next general question. If you want to give that some consideration, you might want to come back to that. Uh, another particular question um, was, and it's, uh, the evidence tells us that we don't know the effect of community education and prevention campaigns. I have listened to many examples of community education initiatives at the conference from dedicated practitioners. We do know that targeting education campaigns to those that are high risk is a better strategy yet many organisations still spend their limited resources investing in community-wide, untargeted initiatives. What are your thoughts on this? So I'll just open that to the panel, to, in, no, in, no, in no particular speaker, probably every speaker, um, sort of, I suppose, ad hoc, broad-ranging, broad-spectrum, mm. um, untargeted education programs. Uh, I should have Anthony up here for this, I think. Anthony Morgan, who from AIC, who's done work previously looking at impacts of different kinds of initiatives. Um, and yet, I think that's, that's right in terms of the evidence around um, publicity campaigns is, is pretty weak. Um, I think most of it's, uh, partly that's a measurement failure, there's just not much Australian material uh, in that space, I don't think. I uh, hope I'm getting a nod for, no, I'm not. Yes, I am, good. <laughs> uh, and uh, and that, that, that's, that's from overseas, it isn't uh, particularly uh, encouraging uh, either. Um, one that springs to mind, that, that, so, so often what you'll see is that, that the only evaluation that gets done is, is about uh, are people aware? And so you've, you've done, undertaken a campaign, uh, are people aware of that campaign undertaken, been undertaken? Um, but also, often they don't go the next step to see whether people have actually changed behaviours or not. Uh, and I think it was John Burroughs in the UK did an interesting study years ago which uh, was around uh, locking up cars in, in the days when you had to use a key rather than uh, central locking and, and basically they had a, had a campaign uh, to raise awareness and uh, through the radio and other means and then they followed up by actually going and checking people's doors to see if they're open and I'm not sure they can get the, the legitimacy of that now but um, they, uh, they basically found that there was no difference, that it hadn't had in, any impact and I think that's, uh, picking up on um, Rosie Batty's point like around uh, you know, the, the cigarette campaigns mm -hmm. that have taken uh, you know, decades for that really message to ram home. Um, you've got to ask yourself, why would you expect giving out a leaflet is going to have any impact on people's behaviour at the end of the day? Um, the only other point I'd make is that um, we've been looking at uh, a particular project where uh, an online system that provides crime prevention advice, and what we actually found was that uh, it was actually repeat victims that were most likely to use that kind of in information. And I think that's, you know, where you can certainly start to target um, you, your information or those who are particularly receptive once they've been, 
the victims, victim of multiple times. Thanks very much. Yeah, Garner. Uh, my response to that is just don't do it. Um, I see a lot of local governments in particular, work I've done, if we've got over 600 local governments in Australia, a whole lot of them out there doing um, some fairly low level campaigns and spending money without sharing the resources across areas. I think there's, uh, I think it's a federal kind of campaign issue. I think the, if we're going to do it well, it will be done with big money. It won't be done with lots of small pots of money that are ill-conceived and often um, ill-targeted. I think the learnings from uh, the alcohol and other drug world, uh, social marketing and public health need to be considered and really segmenting your market and thinking about the messages for your market. It's actually a really sophisticated and difficult task, but you end up seeing lots of pretty low-level education campaigns that um, are a bit ill-directed. Um, I, I think it comes from a good place, good intentions, but probably results in a lot of resources being frittered away unnecessarily. So I think the idea of pooling resources, I've sort of had a long view that we do way too many small scale projects without binding together to actually build a better pool of resources that can then allow for a better campaign and some decent evaluation or um, social market social marketing testing. Yeah, thanks, Garner. Uh, Regan. I, I think what we've got to look at is actually what is the message that they're trying to get across. And you, and you do, you see so many um, they're not really well targeted for what they're trying to achieve with the messaging. But when you have a look at the ones that are successful, you've got the slip slop slap campaigns. They're the big federal ones that they're really trying. They've really thought about what is the message that we're trying to do out there. It's all about lives. The other one, the Grim Reaper, if we go back, that was all about those sorts of things. They were really well thought out and they were federally done. And as you said, they put all the big vickies into the one basket to get the message out nationally. That's what you've got to be looking at it because effectively it is a waste of time, this sort of instant gratification to get something out there. It's all about sustainability. The messaging has got to be sustainable for the long term to actually make it a success. And I think that's where we're probably not hitting the mark and it's like we're going to have a quick grab for so much funds to do this. I'll tick the box that it's done. I don't think that's the way we're going at the moment and I don't think there's anything to actually measure the success of all these little little sort of boutique sort of things that are going along. I mean, it speaks to the point of short-term political cycles up to a point too, I guess, and, you know, what's, uh, what's, what's, what's a populist position yeah. with the community at a particular time uh, in a particular area as to what they think well, the politicians want us to spend money on too, I, I, in my, to, my estimation. You've got to have the courage and the voice yeah. to say this is not going... And particularly from a policing organisation, that we can't be well, we're going to have it a quick fix. You've got to have the courage to say this is a 10-year plan, yeah. this is a 20-year plan, and to say that it's OK, to have the courage to stand up and say this is what, what it is. And that's the same with anything, even with government. Politicians and courage don't necessarily go together in I the know. same sentence, but... <laughs> I know. But, but, get... but Chief Robert Davies will talk to Justin it's Trudeau true. and his example <laughs> of where that <laughs> may actually be the it case. Right. So yeah, I'll hand over to Rob. I, I agree. It's the, the long-term ones that have been successful, looking from the Canadian context, and I'm sure it's very similar here. If you look at uh, the society's outlook on drinking and driving, yeah. uh, today compared to even 20 years ago, uh, never mind 30 years ago, completely, it's unacceptable now. Uh, but it's because of that commitment and long-term uh, determination. But I think it was augmented by when, as the message continued to grow when the communities owned it, like we had the national messaging, but also you had groups like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, yeah. Students Against Drunk Driving, also joining in, so it was really society-driven. Uh, again, the, uh, the example from this morning about our attitudes towards smoking. Uh, smoking is no longer acceptable. Uh, ironic in Canada, though, we're about to legalize marijuana. But, <laughs> but, uh, but smoking in general, that message sustained over 20, 30 years, smoking is no longer acceptable. So it has to be uh, that determination, that long, that long view of it. Uh, the other thing, it's a phrase I like to use called know your dance. Uh, if you don't know how to tango or you shouldn't tango, then don't tango. And as police, I find we, ju we jump into areas to deliver a message that really is probably not best coming from us. Yeah. So that's where we have to be a, have those partnerships in place so that we're behind the scenes collaborating so those that are best suited to deliver the message and have more, more of a receptive audience, they deliver the message. So know your dance. There's been three particular long-term strategies there, 
uh, the smoking campaign or the anti-smoking campaign has been mentioned, the Slip Slop Slap, which of course is the sun, scan sun cancer prevention program in Australia, and the drink driving campaign to reduce the, uh, the incidence of drink driving, they've all been long term, they've all, all beyond a generation. So, uh, I mean, the fixes for some of these other crime prevention strategies, I suspect, may be another generation um, beyond as well. But we, uh, we need to focus on, um, you know, the key issues and the priorities at the moment. All right, so um, we've had, we're about the halfway point now uh, in the panel discussion. So we've had some, um, some, some broader questions and a couple of specific questions on notice. Does anyone have any particular questions? Now, we've got our volunteers here with their microphones and they're going to race around and uh, give you a voice. So um, please raise your hand if you've got a particular question for a particular panel member or broadly for all panel members. And we have one right down here uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the first level down there, thanks. Just put your hand up again, thanks. Yep. This would be a tough question too. Hello. Um, I've noticed a bit of a theme with some of the presentations where the best impacts have been where they've had victim impact statements or some kind of victim impact story particularly with Rosie Batty. I'm just wondering if that's something that needs to be or could be explored more in terms of um, people understanding crime prevention and, and how it's a lot of crimes aren't victimless crimes. A lot of people look at crimes and if they can't see a victim, they don't, it doesn't resonate to them as a, personally. So I'm just wondering if, if in terms of studies and, and things that, have, that you've done, whether that's something that's um, stood out as a, as a solution or, or something that impacts the success of crime prevention activity. There's lots of writing going up here, Kate, so... Yeah. I'll open it up to the, uh, to the panel, anyone who wants to... have a crack at that. Um, it could be a bit off the mark. Uh, there are probably a couple of ways to interpret your question, and uh, I think... I think there's great political purchase associated with having that notion of victim impact that it personalises and concentrates the mind, particularly of politicians and policy makers, of the real consequences. The one thing I'd, uh, on the flip side of that, if I interpret the question slightly differently, is there are some challenges about how you might use sort of the story of victims more specifically in crime prevention programs that target, target perpetrators. Um, and, and that gets a little bit more complex because kind of the notion of victim empathy might apply to you and I but might be a bit redundant for particular populations and I think there's a there's sort of a sense that we should try and use the victim story to get young people and others to take responsibility for their actions but I'm not always sure that that translates into that kind of outcome so I think at a broad policy level I think it makes a great deal of sense to try and tell stories about people and the impacts um, particularly having listened to some of the presentations on fraud and, and trying to get people to understand that there are personal implications. This isn't just a, a dollar on, on your bank statement. Um, but in that context of offenders, I think it gets slightly more complicated. So that's kind of a bit of a cop-out there, but it, it does get more complicated than just simply getting people to understand the impacts uh, of victimisation. I feel I'm probably in danger of losing friends here, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I guess what I'd, I'd suggest is that um, th those kind of victim stories are no substitute for a careful analysis of the problem and coming up with a, an evidence-based approach to dealing with, with uh, that issue. And I guess what it comes down to is, is what both Anna uh, spoke about yesterday and Kate today about mechanism. If you like. Well, what, what's the mechanism by which you'd anticipate those kinds of victim stories uh, having any kind of impact on... Uh, reducing or preventing crime subs subsequently. Uh, and I think there are far more, uh, plenty of other more effective approaches for all kinds of crime types other than relying on victim statements. Yes, I'll throw the rest of the panel members if they want to, if they want to take it. If not, that's fine. Nope. Uh, any other questions? A follow-up question? No, there's another one down here. Thank you. Um, this might be more directed to the researchers on the panel. Um, we heard before about how research can help practitioners, especially in evidence-based policing. Um, I'd like to take it back a step and how can practitioners help 
researchers and um, what would you like to see from practitioners to help make or d develop research and evidence um, more suitable to helping them do their job? We might have different views on this. So, uh, uh, Massive advocate for having practitioner voice in research. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of collective wisdom and knowledge that resides in practitioner worlds that are infrequently acknowledged in kind of the academic um, sphere. Uh, I, I think that it would be really useful for much more action research to be conducted in, in this field. I think we, there's a risk of being too scientific and careful about the science and that will be to exclude populations from participating. So I was reading you know, a bit of Nils Christie's work on the way up and you know, he kind of, sadly before his death, saying way too much specialisation that in actual fact we should be um, much more open to hearing from people who can solve their problems themselves and not have that problem owned by us as experts. So I, I'm sort of really interested in engagement between the academy and practitioners in a much more applied way rather than just expecting kind of the researchers to do the work. Um, almost every room you walk into, there's hundreds of years of experience that isn't captured at all well in our What Works database. And I'd love to see better ways of some of that being bled through um, to, to reflect how policy should be developed. I, I don't think we're a million, million miles away actually okay. on this, this one, but I, I wrote something a couple of years ago on, um, about gaining credibility for researchers in policing research. And I think there was kind of a number of particular points where that credibility gets challenged as a researcher working with, with practitioners. I mean, one is, getting a foot in the door in the first place and that kind of willingness to engage with uh, researchers and to, 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 to uh, take us on, if you like, as a, uh, because, you know, it's because there's a risk that you, you may come up with something that, that they don't, the practitioners don't like. So there is that kind of uh, credibility of being accepted in the first place. And I think there's good reason why practitioners in the past have perhaps not engaged in, in perhaps the open way that researchers would like because we can be critical, uh, and I think we need to find a way of actually being uh, balanced and providing uh, kind of insights without being threatening, I think. Um, but there's also, um, I, I, I come back to, I guess, the, po the point, the question I asked of um, uh, uh, Peter Norman yesterday around, uh, well, the, the observation about um, being willing to uh, accept failure. Uh, as, uh, uh, as practitioners, um, and there's a bit of a truism as, as researchers that when you conduct uh, a research report and find something that's critical, uh, or something that doesn't work, um, you find that you get much more uh, critique of your research and your methodology than you do when you find that something's fantastic. No one ever questions your methodology when something's fantastic. So, so uh, there's, there's, there's the credibility there as well and about uh, accepting uh, uh, that, you know, practitioners need to accept that there are times when things don't work and there's lessons to be learned from research. Success has many parents, fathers and orphans, is that what you're saying? <laughs> okay, um, Robert, I noticed you're ma making some notes there. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether you had some insight into this what can the practitioners, what do they want from the researchers? How can we work closer together, turning the question around? Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe you weren't writing about that. But <laughs> <laughs> well, you were probably writing your closing remarks, I'm, I'm sure. It was a list of favourite Australian beers, actually. Yeah, a list of Australian beers. <laughs> 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 Now that will explain why you were writing so furiously, because it's a long <laughs> list. It's a long list. Yeah. Uh, I will touch on it briefly. Just uh, you may, what I did write actually was academics want to get their foot in the door, and that is so true. Mm -hmm. And we talk a big game, and I'm speaking from the Canadian perspective. We talk a big game that we want a partner, but when I go to the Canadian Association Chiefs of Police and I look at people that are actually transitioning the rhetoric into action of partnering with academics, there's few champions that make, make it look like we're moving that way, but actual, if I were to look coast to coast and see, ask every chief to be honest and look in the mirror, would you like to partner with academics? I don't know what the response would be. I, I'm not, I wouldn't want to bet a lot of money on it that they'd be open, willing to open that yeah. door. Yeah. 
Uh, so, uh, now, having said that, I'm very optimistic that we're at, a, we're at a very interesting time in policing with the baby boom generation walking out the door in retirement. Uh, are finding that in the Canadian context, police officers are better educated to start with. We're coming in with, with at least a bachelor's degree quite often. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, already setting the, frame, the, the stage nicely for us to be more accepting of academics to come in and work in true partnership. Thanks very much, Robert. Regan, domestic and family yeah. violence. Um, you know, we've heard about it today uh, in large measure. So, um, practitioner's world, back into research? <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's a no-brainer. We have to work together for us to be able to succeed into the future. I mean, in my unit where I am at the moment, one of the first people I got employed with was a, a research officer, specifically for our unit, to have a look at everything. So we're working, um, we're working all the time with the academics. And it's, really, it's valuable because if I want to improve any products that we're using, you're not going to say, we'll just change the font. Yeah. You actually want to go and have a look and say, we've used this product now for three years, let's go back to the makers, how can we actually improve it? Or keep it as it is. You have to work in partnerships. I think it's something, it is foreign to police to do that. It is foreign to do that because part of the things when you're working with academics is they are very transparent in their research, so they will be showing both sides of the coin. And when you see both sides of the coin, it means you're going to have to read and accept failures and where we actually have room for improvement. So I, I think it's the only way forward for us. It's the only way that we're going to be continually to grow as an organisation. Because policing now in this day and age is not just the default of arrest and that. It really is. Most of the things we're dealing with is just social issues. You can only do that in collaboration with our partner agencies, and the only way you can do that is to have it acknowledged and to say, this is what we need to be able to do. The justice system and accountability is much broader. Accountability is a much broader thing, so you actually have to have our research partners. That's what I think. Thanks very much for that. I'm employed tomorrow, but... Now, I'm looking for another question. Oh, this will be a good one. <laughs> From one of the keynote presenters. Um, just listening to the conversation, it's kind of interesting that um, there's this sort of dichotomy between the fact that we want to encourage partnerships between mm -hmm. academics and uh, practitioners, but also we might want to try and professionalise um, the organisation and get people with skills in the organisation. And so, it, it, I mean, in, in a way we need both, but I'm just wondering how we find that balance between making sure that people who are bright, that have got the right professional skills, are actually getting into the organisations and incentivising them to do it, and having these kind of partnerships with, with, uh, between academic and, uh, and professional organisations. Um, just, just to tell a backstory, one of the problems we had in the UK has been that um, we, we train a lot of people in crime analysis um, at, the, at UCL, and um, one of the problems is that the crime analyst jobs, as they used to be, um, first of all, there's far less of them, but secondly, people were finding that they had you know, these high-level analysis skills and the um, and the crime analysis jobs, you know, were not that were not that um, well paid, and there wasn't really very far for people to go in terms of a career in this kind of thing. So I just wonder if people had any uh, reaction to those sorts of questions. Thanks very much, Kate. Rick, I, I, one observation is is around the kind of rollout or the the introduction of evidence-based policing. Like we're kind of very much at the early stages, I guess here. In, in Australia, uh, and it seems to me there's a bit of a there's a bit, uh, bit of debate, I suppose, as to uh, how you go about instilling the research, perhaps that, that underpins that, and whether you go for uh, a, a kind of embedded criminologist type uh, model um, and what that looks like. So I think a number of uh, police jurisdictions are going down the line of um, uh, employing a um, a member of staff who's a, who's a criminologist. Um, and the thing that worries me about that is that um, it's very difficult to be um, perhaps critical in the way that those, those people need to be to push the agenda and to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to in, in a sense, um, threaten the conventional wisdom uh, if your paymaster is the organization that you're uh, mm -hmm. critiquing. Um, so I think we need to find a model that allows you to, to perhaps draw on the expertise 
um, that doesn't have that kind of threat where people won't be willing to speak because their jobs are on the line if they if they those contracts are up for renewal in a year's time. Um, yeah. It's kind of way around that. For me, from an organisational perspective and from a discipline perspective, yeah, the, the, the notion of professionalisation for me is a way forward. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that we are not professional, mm. but in terms of professionalisation of a discrete body of knowledge and a, and a, you know, a discipline and a, and a registered sort of uh, network of uh, pro professional practitioners, mm. uh, for me, is, uh, is, a, is a step forward in the right direction. Mm. Um, we've had a lot, there's lots of barriers to that, I know. But, uh, you know, again, that might overcome in part what you were talking about there, Rick. Mm. But I'd be interested to hear from other members of the panel in relation to Kate's, uh, to Kate's question. Uh, Garner, you'd probably have an a position on this, I would su suspect. Position on most, most things. Um, <laughs> positions aren't always uh, useful. But the, my response to that is probably a bit oblique, but I'm kind of interested in what big data is going to bring and how much that's going to be a bit of a, ja a game changer. In terms of some of this data, as it becomes more accessible, is kind of less owned by any one agency. And there might be opportunities that grow from that that I think might change some of the discussion. Uh, so I'm seeing it in a small way where, where our sort of translational data science people are starting to engage with projects in a way that I, I think is fundamentally transforming people's kind of views about research and research ethics and the time that it's going to take to ask questions when data can be captured more quickly and analysed more quickly and fed back into the system. It might completely change some of those relationships and the expectations of organisations incentivising or building career paths for people internally. So I'd really like to see many more relationships established, obviously I'm at a university now so I'm going to say that, but many more relationships with universities where some of that work might be might be done for organisations that it doesn't have to necessarily be, be in-house. And that by virtue of the, the increasing transparency that one hopes that comes from that, there'll be less um, protection uh, and sensitivity around some of those uh, issues. I said it was a bleak and it was. Thanks very much, Garner. <laughs> Um, great question, Kate. Now, time is against us, uh, and I'm going to call for the last question right now. Our panel members will give a very, very brief summary at the end of this before they, uh, before they leave the stage. So we've got time for one more question. I've got a few concluding remarks to go. So uh, our time is just about right. Thank you. Very important last question. I hope I articulate this well. Um, within our organisation, we do have a lot of people that are on the street that do have a tertiary education. Um, a lot of those tertiary educations are from, obviously, universities in Queensland. I'm currently from the QPS. Would there be any pathways or any interactions post-grad to tap into those universities to be able to set a pathway from the grassroots level? to have that structure to be able to be guided through. Because I think the ability to be able to say, this is the degree I have and this is the application I have, where can it help you guys and help you from the ground up? Does that make sense? I, I'm not very good at articulating that. I apologise. Makes sense to me. Sense and um, can I ask Robert, from a Canadian perspective, which tends to be a different, slightly different policing kind of sort of environment from ours, certainly in terms of you know, organisational structures and, and mobility, particularly in, in the north of America. Uh, outstanding question and very topical in southern Alberta. Uh, to, the, to the east of us is a police service medicine hat, just a little bit smaller than we are. But we're having this discussion as we speak with uh, Lethbridge College and, and talking about... It, it runs parallel to the professionalism of policing, but exactly that is what we find in Canada is we hire a number of officers that have a diploma from a college or a degree from a university, uh, but we have a number of officers that have come in without that and they take hundreds of courses throughout the course of a career and then mid-career decide I'm going to try and get it or work towards my degree and when they go to have the prior learning assessments done, none of the courses, very few are being recognized by the academic institutions. So here the police community has spent thousands and thousands of dollars in training that's not recognized in the by the academic community. Uh, the, Canadian police car the Canadian Police College, which is administered by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, have actually uh, identified this and done a lot of great work in 
ironically, with an, uh, an Australian institution, Charles Stewart, where if you take our Senior Police Administration course and the Executive Development uh, Program through CPC, it's half of your, your course load for the master's degree through Charles Stewart. So we're moving in that direction. But the discussions we're having in Alberta is as one moves along their career, I'm going to use the word right, and it's probably not. Do we reserve the right as the employer to, to put the expectation on the officers that here are the basic courses you will need, critical thinking, different things like that. And so at a certain stage, that whether it be 10 years or 12 years, you will have enough academic courses to qualify for at least a bachelor's if you don't have it already, or maybe a second bachelor's. And then from there, streamline where you want to go towards a master's. So we're having this exact discussion, but it's in its infancy. And, we, and, and the sad part is that uh, empires get in the way because Lethbridge and Medicine Hat combined don't equal the size of Calgary or Edmonton or the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. So we're, we're having this discussion, but the, the, the empires get in the way that the minute somebody sees it as a, a meaningful initiative, they may pick up and run with it. But there's, we're having the discussion that there is a need because right now it seems to be willy-nilly. Uh, people don't, they, we, we all put in course, or uh, sorry, career plans, but no real structure to those course, or those career plans beyond that. Thanks, Robert. Now, any other comments from other panel members? Thanks. I'm trying to say, I think education is really crucial and important and valuable, but I worry about the commodification of knowledge and uh, the marketization. We're seeing proliferation of degrees and people being expected to have second and third and fourth and fifth degrees. I know people who are embarking on their third PhD, which just seems absurd. Um, <laughs> and this notion of racking up personal debt for the pursuit of a qualification where people are spending less time in the qualification, more time just seeking to get the actual tick in the box. Uh, I, I think we, we should fundamentally have a conversation about what's more important. Organisationally, I think what's more important is having smart people being reflective practitioners, not having a lot of people who are churning out degrees because they think that's what's needed. Mm. And I see lots of uh, students, not necessarily police officers, but students who are just racking up massive personal debt because they think that's what the labour market wants and we're overstimulating the tertiary education sector. So if Regan's going to get sacked tomorrow, so <laughs> might I. Um, but we need to be very cautious about this whole movement because it is costing people money and it doesn't necessarily translate to career paths or, or greater incomes, if that was our only goal. There's nothing like a couple of good sackings out of a panel, but anyway, yeah. um, uh, Robert. <laughs> uh, I want to throw the question uh, to the rest of the panel because this is the discussion in Canada that we're having is in the process of professionalising police, does the requirement for at least a bachelor's degree add validity or credentialing to our profession? Uh, or, and it's, very, it's a very decisive debate. Some are saying no. Some of the best police officers did not have a bachelor's degree and went on to become high ranking. Uh, there's no guarantee that a degree is going to equate to proficiency in policing. So this, I'm just interested in what your perspective is. I mean, is professionalism based on a, your as your degree, or is it on your behaviours and your performance? And I think that's what it's all about. And I think we've got to remember, policing, for most people, I would suggest, and, and you actually hit it on it yesterday, and it stands very strong for me, it's a vocation. And part of that vocation is your education as you're going along there. And I think we have to acknowledge that. Because for some people, um, academic studies becomes quite easy, and it can become quite an addiction as well to you know, want to do more and more and more. But for other people, your life skills, your actual experiences, your behaviours and your performance, is that's your professionalism as well. Your ethical behaviour, your integrity of coming to work and what you're putting into that job. You cannot discount that. And I think that's where we must be very conscious, part of our organisations, part of management and that, that we don't um, have our members that feel undervalued as a member of our organisation, if they don't have a bachelor's degree, that you're not as valuable. We, the value of a person is not necessarily on the rank or, or their letters behind their names, it's on their performance. That's how I feel, I look at it as well. Awesome. And yet we shouldn't confuse professionalism with professionalisation yeah. uh, in, the, in the next breath, of course. And so 
Uh, what a great final question there, and it stirred up a little bit of interest there, and it's even created a, 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 a sub uh, presenter within the group itself, to the, which I think is fantastic. <laughs> but, what I, but what I want to do is I want to allow each of the panel members uh, a very, very brief moment to just give us their parting shot, as it were, about um, what they took away from here, where to next, whatever you would like to say. But I'm going to start with, uh, with Ghana first, I'm going, then I'm going to go to Regan, uh, I'm going to go to Rick, and then we're going to leave our guest from Canada uh, the final say. I'll be quick, build on what I've said. I think this notion of political science is a really important thing. There are really big issues that sit on the periphery of our world that should be perhaps closer to the centre. I spoke about the rise of um, big NGOs in a presentation I made. I think there's massive changes occurring where government is stepping back from delivering services that government should be held accountable for. I think there are problems on the horizon around the reduction of welfare and human services, and I think that should be part of our thinking. That was a big part of early discussions about crime prevention in this country, and I think if we get too technocratic, we lose sight of some really big questions about vulnerable populations being dudded by um, governments who are seeking to withdraw uh, funding and support in areas that I think are crucial to maintaining safe and healthy communities. Thanks. Regan. Uh, yeah, I, I suppose for me, I just still think it's, it is exciting times for all of us at the moment. And I think the last two days, it sort of just reconfirms that we have got permission to actually be innovative. We have got permission to sort of move forward and have the courage to be able to work with our partner agencies. And when I say that, it's not just your government, it is the NGO sector, it's the people in the businesses, our communities. Policing, we can't solve this alone. We're always, we're not necessarily the lead agency with a lot of the social issues that are out there, but we're usually the drivers and we're the ones that are the, the doers and get things done. But I think what the last two days has really indicated to me that I think that this is the time to have the courage and stand up and say, join me and let's do it together. And, let's, yes. and I think we have to do that. And it's not just in work, but all our monies when we do this, be a little bit innovative. Don't just be putting in one little package for money, do it collaboratively. Mm. put all of our partner AGC together. None of it can be achieved without that goodwill, but also mm. that money. Mm. Rick? I, I guess I just want to uh, finish up where I started yesterday by uh, you know, kind, of, kind of highlighting that the AIC is not just about undertaking research, it's about disseminating it as, as well. So that's what our act's about. And, uh, and I think the last two days uh, have been about you know, disseminating <laughs> uh, knowledge in a whole variety of ways with five keynotes, 45 concurrent, two workshops and a symposium, so hopefully people have, have taken at least something away that's new that they didn't know before over those uh, uh, two days. And finally, just thank you for staying so long as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Rick. Uh, by any measure, this has been a successful conference. Mm. And uh, last say for our panel member tonight is uh, Chief Robert Davis. Uh, first of all, thank you for your comment about judged on your abilities and performance, not the letters after your name. That's where I fall in the debate back in Canada, so you, you make me feel validated, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, very refreshing for me to see the academic community embedded in-house, and to your comment about doing it, not having to be in-house, I suggest it's, it's more palatable for the police community when the academics are seen in-house. Mm -hmm. Just one of those quirky things with the police culture. Uh, but it's refreshing to see the, the, embed, the, the academics embedded with the police here. Mm -hmm. So keep up the great work. Uh, I just want to share, I like to leave on a light note. Yep, so of course. You got my, my great mm -hmm. joke yesterday about our American neighbours. <laughs> uh, this one's about, people have asked, what does Canada mean? How did it get its name? What is it? Uh, the, the popular belief it is a, a native word, Canada, that means the village. But I'm going to tell you the real story. So the real story is our friends to the south came up with this little USA, USA. So our four, or the founding fathers sat around, we have to come up with a name for our country. And you know, in south of the border, they've come up with this really catchy USA. So why, why don't we come up with something similar with a few, you know, a few letters and it'll be catchy. So they sat around, how oh, X, Y, Z? No, it doesn't fly. A, B, C? No. And then Sir John A runs into the room. Sir John A McDonald. I've thought of it, fellas. I've got three letters. What's it going to be? C A, D A, N A, and have a good trip home, eh? <laughs> <laughs> it was great to meet all of you, and sincerely on that last part, I, I wish you the best of travels uh, on your journeys home. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Chief. Now, I've got a couple of uh, very, very uh, small tokens of our appreciation for Regan and for Ghana for their contribution to the panel uh, today. Now, of course, Rick and, uh, and Robert have already received their presentations um, yesterday. And, uh, but before we do part, I just want to make special mention of a range of people. Uh, all of the sessions over the last two days have been chaired by a range of people. Samantha Bricknell, Rick Brown, Anthony Morgan and Christopher Dowling from the Australian Institute of Criminology, Les Bullis, Dan Hurst, Rod Bell and Peter Trelaw from the QPS. Would you put your hands together for those people for chairing those sessions? Uh, Kate Sweeney and the team out on the Secretariat desk from the Australian Institute of Criminology plus the team of volunteers. Fantastic job, guys. Really, really appreciate it. It couldn't have been the success that it has been without our keynote speakers, wonderful people, wonderful presentations and some wonderful content in there. Our session speakers, our workshop facilitators and our panel members, uh, fantastic. So uh, I think it's been a fantastic two-day conference. And uh, in uh, the spirit of recycling, uh, if you would like to recycle your name badge, leave your lanyards with the secretary desk before you go. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much for your contribution over the last two days. Hope you've got something out of it. I know you've got something out of it. And we'd love to see you back at the next uh, Crime Prevention and Communities Conference in two years' time. Thank you very much. Safe journey home. <laughs>